Oh, hi. Hello, everyone. I'm Father Aaron. Welcome to The Dungeon Minister. So, it's been a while. I apologize for the long pause, but... Well, essentially, this video series caught up to the table. When I first started the channel, going on a year now, we were two months out. And so I was making videos of things that we had played weeks previous, which is part of why I always forgot details here and there. Thank you. Anyhow, over the course of the past months, uh, we'll have missed a week here or there. Uh, I was busy around Christmas and Holy Week and Easter, and the boys were camping with cubs or scouts or something. Things happened, and we would miss the occasional week as I continued to pretty regularly make videos, and so I closed the gap, and with the last episode, I Want My Mummy, I actually caught up to myself. So I didn't have anything to record. That, and then being on vacation, out camping, all this kind of... At any rate, I'm making excuses. I didn't have anything to record anyway, but here I am now. When we finally got back to the game, our heroes, just to remind you, that is two fourth-level elves, a fifth-level halfling, and a sixth-level, now, thief. Our heroes were still standing guard over the road repair work. Remember, there's a crew coming down from Honeywood, and our group is coming with them, and another crew coming up from Kilmarnock, to repair the road between the two communities. This road repair, incidentally, um, well, the road doesn't look like this. Neither does the road even look like this. The road looks like this. It's really little more than a footpath, although better trafficked than a simple footpath, and clearly wide enough, just wide enough, for wagons, and more commonly, used by uh, carts, a medieval cart. Incidentally, if you want to see a really good video about medieval hand carts, check out Modern History. In general, it's a great channel. I really enjoy it. And if you play in a fantasy you know, role-playing system, he's got some great information, historic information, about the way things worked with militaries and, and, and other things, including hand carts. And it's really neat to kind of import some of that. Anyway, shout out to that channel. It's a lot of fun. But... That's the kind of thing that would have been used on this road mostly. The occasional wagon, a lot of handcarts, and a lot of people on horseback or on foot. Anyhow, the repair work in question is really just filling in. Like, there's a low spot that's been worn low and it gets all muddy, so they need to move some earth around to fill that up. A tree has fallen across the path and, and needs to be moved, or, or a, a sapling has started growing up in the path and... So many people have gone around it that it's now becoming a problem, right? They've got to take a tree out of the path. That kind of stuff, all right? So it's not serious repaving work. There's no asphalt involved. But they are doing some road repair. And the heroes are standing guard over that. At any rate, they are standing guard over that road work one fine day, at watching the, the odd merchant pass by, the odd traveler go by, just keeping an eye on things, when they hear, coming from the south, hoofbeats and they prepare. They have been confronted on this road before by centaurs a few adventures ago, and so they don't know exactly what's coming, but it does turn out to be horsemen, uh, humans on horseback. Soldiers, in fact, coming from Kilmarnock. Soldiers of the Count, if you can take their gold and black livery to mean anything. And it does. They are soldiers sent from Kilmarnock. The group reins up as they approach the construction, and the leader dismounts and approaches and introduces himself. I really should think through these names beforehand. I should get a list of names. I should name the character. I should, at least the night before, I should pick the name instead of doing it you know, during the game and, and actually having to come up with something on the fly because, well, he came up and introduced himself as Faramir. I, I, I'm sorry, Professor, I'm sorry, but he's a captain of a guard, he's out with a, you know, a lightly armed, um, you know, 
fast anyway it's Faramir is his name so he introduces himself and of course the boys I've read Lord of the Rings to them so they they recognize the name immediately and laugh at me <laughs> anyway he introduces himself and says that they are wanted in Kelmarnock the count wants to talk to them Count Cormac himself has summoned them. Their fame is spreading. He says, you are to come with me. But they, well, regarding this, this road work, we have to stand guard. He says, no, that's why I brought four more soldiers. They dismount and say, here, you take the horses. You're supposed to ride back now. Of course, one of them's a halfling, which isn't going to work out. A halfling and a horse isn't a great combination. So Faramir takes the extra horse in rain, and Touchberry gets up on a horse with faux fire. So he's going to ride and kind of behind, holding on desperately as they go. Without further ado, they bid farewell to the road crew, up on the horses, and south to Kilmarnock. Uh, they're on horseback, and they're already a good deal south, so this journey just takes the rest of the day. They approach Kilmarnock at night. Uh, dimly illuminated by stars and moon, they can make out the shapes of the stone buildings rising up ahead of them. It is still an impressive sight. They've been here a couple of times now, but it is always an impressive sight when you, know, you live in a place the size of Honeywood, right? These huge stone walls and big stone buildings. It catches the eye. Into the city they ride, and he takes them to the guardhouse. Just inside the city walls, there's a, a, a barracks for some of the soldiers. There would be barracks scattered throughout the city in various places, but at each gate there's a, a relatively large one, and Faramir's horse guards are attached to this barracks. So he takes them there, and they dismount, and someone takes the horses off, and he leads them upstairs to a dining hall. He says, you must be hungry, and of course Touchberry says, yes, famished. So he provides them a meal, Touchberry eats the entire thing, he has to bring another meal for the other characters, Touchberry eats that one as well. <coughs> this goes on for a little while, they're just having fun. And so they go to sleep. The first really solid night's sleep they've had in a while, because they have been out on guard duty, remember, spelling each other off, having you know, two posted every night. So this is the best sleep they've gotten in a while. They sleep late. And the next morning they can hear the sound of soldiers eating their breakfast out in the main hall. And they emerge out there, Touchberry first, obviously, and partake of some breakfast. They're still shoving their faces full when Faramir comes through and tells them that they are expected at the Count's Palace at 10 o'clock. It's like 6 in the morning now, or 7 or something. They've got some hours. I wasn't real precise with it because it really didn't matter. They've got some time. So they can explore a little bit of Kilmarnock. Now, there are two things they want to do while they're here in the city. One of them is to purchase horses. Also, um, after the fight with the dragon, they saved all sorts of body parts. It's a little grisly, but they've got scales, they've got teeth, they've got claws, and Fleetwood saved a bone, you know, one of the leg bones of the beast. And what he wants to do is he wants to take this leg bone to someone to fashion into a sword. He wants it carved and sharpened and made into a sword, which he then plans to give to Count Cormac. He wants to make a gift to the Count of Kilmarnock. And I tell him they're not going to have it done by 10 o'clock. You know that, don't you? Yeah, yeah, of course I know that. Okay. But I want to I see if I can get it done. Oh, well, you know, all right, while you're in the city, look around, see if you can find that. You're probably not going to have enough time to even source that before 10 o'clock, because that's going to take some time to find the right artisans, but yeah, you can do that. Okay. The other thing they want to do, if you remember from the last episode, they all have tomb rot, a disease given to them by the mummy. The mummy's touch, in addition to the damage it does when it hits, it also causes this sort of decaying rot on them, which has prevented them from regaining any hit points. Doesn't matter if they rest, doesn't matter if they drink a healing potion, doesn't matter if a cleric, you know, casts cure light wounds on them, nothing will restore those hit points. So they're all still relatively low. I mean, that adventure was probably too easy. They weren't as beat up as they should have been. But they're still all low in hit points, and they can't recover any of them. So the first thing they want to do before horses is they want to visit the kill of Marnock, the cell of Marnock, the shrine, and find a cleric who can cure them of this tomb rot. So... There, as they make their way through the city in the early morning, their first stop is indeed to the Shrine of Marnock, Marnock's Kill, Marnock's Cell. 
It is an enormous building for them. It's the biggest building they've ever seen, and inside it is largely one big open space. So it's pretty impressive. It's not open when they arrive, so they have to wait around outside. Finally, the doors open, and because they're early, they get in and they have no trouble finding someone to talk to. They again approach a low-level acolyte, who then runs off and brings back a higher-level cleric. Um, hello, hello. What are your names? How can Monarch's clerics help you today? <laughs> they describe their situation, and the roly-poly individual leads them off to a side chapel where he performs the healing for a small fee. There's no quest involved this time. They just take straight cold hard cash. Right? So they get their tomb rot cured. So now they're going to be able to recover hit points. They thank him. They pay him. Off they go looking for horses. They ask around as they go through the city streets, you know, where are horses sold? Where can I buy a horse? And they are directed to an ostler very close to the gates. A large stables where horses are not only kept and stabled for a fee, they're also sold, bred and sold. So in they go, and they're looking for three horses and a donkey or mule. What kind of horse are you looking for? War horse, riding horse, draft horse, what you want. You know, horse isn't just a horse, it's all different. Okay, well, we'd like a riding horse. They're not really going to go into battle on these horses. They don't intend to armor them or anything. They just want a means of conveyance, so riding horses. He shows them a selection, and I start describing, you know, this one's a, a, a chestnut kind of color, this one's a black, yeah, blah, blah, blah. They choose three horses. And then it comes to the donkey or mule. Well, I've got a mule you can look at if you want. It's not a very well-tempered beast. So he takes them over to see this mule, which is over in a corner by itself, and it is an ill-tempered creature. It is a, a, a grumpy mule. And you know how mules are, right? They're stubborn to begin with. This one is particularly nasty. Your kind of guy, really. Well, you take shots at me. What do you... Diva. Anyhow, they go to see this mule, and instantly, Touchberry has a friend. I actually roll a reaction for the mule. I actually roll a reaction based on Touchberry's charisma, which isn't great, but the, the mule's like, you're my new best friend. And so this cranky, obnoxious creature somehow connects with Touchberry. Mm -hmm. I don't know what that says about Touchberry. At any rate, he's got his mule. It was kind of a fun bit of role-playing. At any rate... They pay for the animals and then ask to stable them here. Can we pay to keep them here now? And so the master, of course, you know, that's what we do that as well. So they pay a fee and they have their, their horse and, horses and their mule stabled there. It's about time they head over to see the count. Into the market square they enter, and again, the market has been set up and business is already booming here. Across the market square, they see looming the Count's Palace, probably the second biggest building they've ever seen, and they approach it. The palace has on its front a wooden structure, and you know about uh, two floors for the British, or three floors up for the Americans. There's a balcony out of which the, uh, the Count can look and, and address the masses if he has to. There's also, though, a staircase which goes in from the side of the wooden structure and up, and then into the stone palace itself. This structure is in case of attack, it can be pushed away from the building or burned away from the building and leaving no way to access that door without ladders. Anyway, they approach the palace and there are guards there demanding to know their names. They say who they are and one of the guards uh, goes in, speaks to someone, comes back out with Faramir. Faramir has come here to meet them and he leads them in. Up the stairs, into the palace they go, and they enter into a sort of audience chamber, the Great Hall, where the Lord would sit and hear cases from around the, the countryside, all peasants with uh, disputes or um, soldiers who've been accused of something, etc. It all gets heard in this room, a la Game of Thrones and, you know, Beowulf and whatever. So he's got this Great Hall, in they go. And this was another opportunity to use the pillars that I made. I, I really like them, so I, I incorporated them into the design of the room. At the far end, of course, is a dais on which is... Is it a throne for a count? It's a chair. At any rate, there's a chair. And there sits the count. He's a lean man, dressed mostly in black and dark gray, with splashes of yellow here and there. His heraldic colors are black and gold. 
and he has armor on, although it doesn't look like the most serious armor. This is his casual daytime armor. Anyhow, there he sits, regarding them with hawk-like eyes. Over his shoulder stands a man, a huge man. Like, think the Hound from Game of Thrones, right? Huge man, haggard face. This guy has a big black beard, and he scowls at them. It is his job to be suspicious of everyone. He is the Count's right-hand man. And again, not having prepared in advance, having no clue what his name would be, it's Clegane. The bloody hound. It's Sandor Clegane. I'm sorry, George R. R. Martin. I told you before, if you've got two R's in your name, I'm stealing your stuff. So, Sandor Clegane is standing there. Um, he is the personal advisor and guard. He's the right-hand man to the Count, and it's his job to be suspicious of everyone. And so he's watching them like a hawk. There he stands, passive, mute, behind the Count. The Count greets them. Hello, heroes of Honeywood. I have heard much of you. You do not disappoint in person. Greetings and welcome to Kilmarnock. They bow because they know what they're doing, and they speak up, you know, thank you, Lord Cormac, uh, it is uh, an honor to meet you. I, any service we can render you, we are happy to do. The Count says, I have nothing at the moment, but I want to get the measure of you. And so we role-play a conversation, and I don't remember everything we said, it was very loose. Um, tell me about your adventures, tell me about what you've done. I hear that you slew a dragon. Yes, you did. I hear you've had a run-in with werewolves. Yes, we have. And so they, you know, recount some of the adventures they've had. As he takes this in, he's becoming more and more serious. It's becoming less and less, oh, that sounds exciting, and more, oh, really? Indeed. He seems to know a lot about their adventures, particularly the werewolves interest him. He asks a lot of questions about Evalio and about the other werewolves, how many there were, how strong they were, how, what equipment they had. He's very curious about that. At any rate, after a while, he thanks them for coming to visit him and sends them on their way. He says, you may stay at the guardhouse with Faramir again today. Tomorrow you can be on your way. So it's sort of a gentle, here's your hat, what's your hurry, right? <laughs> they thank him for the audience, they bow, and, and out they go. They're about halfway down the stairs, though, when they hear footsteps above them. Down the stairs comes Sandor Clegane. He introduces himself and says, I will walk with you. Why? I don't know, but he does. Out they go into the market, and they're crossing the market. They're actually on their way back to the barracks because it's getting toward lunchtime, and Touchberry's hungry, so they're going to go have a meal at the barracks and explore the city a little bit after that. They're halfway across the market, however, when suddenly there is a scream, a screech, down near the river. The PCs immediately run to it. I mean, the first thing out of my eldest son's mouth is, at Fleetwood, says, Let's go! Weapons out, and they're running across the market to see what's going on. What is going on is that in the row of booths, of tents that are set up for the market, the one closest to the river has been set upon by lizard men. They've crept out of the river to attack the heart of the capital. Word has gotten to them of the attack on their lair, and they are seeking vengeance. In come the PCs, though. Boom! They hit the lizard men, and battle is on. Dice are rolled on each side, and initiative is found, etc. Now, the battle is intense. Let's remember that the PCs have just recently been cured of Tomb Rot, so they haven't really recovered any hit points yet. They now can, but they haven't yet, so they're still low in hit points. A thought that didn't really occur to them before they ran into this battle, I think. Oh well, a little too late to think of that now. Battle on. And it is a hard battle. Uh, the dice are not doing my players any favors. They're mostly missing. And the lizard men are hitting, and hitting hard. I'm starting to get worried that this sort of side skirmish, which was just sort of there to give color, right? You know, the, the world is continuing to move while you're in it. There's, there's events happening, and, and your actions have consequences. It was really just intended to be a sort of side thing, intended to be combat in what was a low combat adventure. At any rate, it was turning out to be really serious. Fortunately, 
Fofire has found her groove. Remember in the battle with the dragon, she was hitting pretty well with that bow. Well, it sings again as she's knocking out lizard man after lizard man. She stays back. She's pretty low in hit points, but she's sending arrows in and hitting them right, left, and center. She's kind of the one bright spot they have in combat. Shortly behind them, however, charges in Sandor Plagane. Massive man. He draws out this enormous sword, and he's just cutting through the lizard men. And he's a higher level fighter, so his hit rolls are easier. He, he's got a magic sword. He's doing a lot of damage. It's brutal. And it creates this really cool image for them, because as they are struggling with this fight, here comes this guy just cutting through them like butter. It was a helpful reminder for them that while they're doing well and they're kind of famous, they're not there yet. They're not, they're not that strong yet. This guy is huge. So he turns the tide of the battle. They eventually do start hitting and they, and they win some of their skirmishes. And they drive, the few remaining lizardmen are driven back to the, the river. There were about a dozen of them. And they are driven back to the river. I'd say about half of them escape, uh, maybe a little under half, and they die. In the river. Okay. Oh. Well, that's a relief. This little side combat, as I said, was, was turning very serious, and it was not looking so good. So, happily, all turned out well in the end. The merchants thank them for their intervention. Sandor thanks them for their intervention. As they're kind of cleaning up and, and helping the merchants back to their feet kind of thing, in rush some, uh, some troops, some guards from Komarnon, who've been attracted by all the noise, and they secure the scene, as it were. They monitor the river. Boats are launched to go up and down the river searching for lizardmen and all that kind of good stuff. But they're long gone. Anyhow, Sandor escorts the, uh, the PCs back to the barracks where they eat their noon meal and they decide they're just going to stay there. They're just going to rest. So they spend that day resting at the barracks and they sleep there that night and uh, have their evening meal and the whole nine yards. They wake up the next day, they're eating breakfast and they're thinking, well, I guess it's, it's homeward bound when Faramir comes to them and informs them the Count wishes them to stay. The Count asks you to remain in the city for a further three days. Okay. Hey, that'll give us time to find someone to work with these dragon parts, because they have all sorts of plans, right? They were going to do that anyway, you know, if, if, even if they were dismissed and sent home, they were going to spend the first part of this day shopping around Kilmarnock, looking for weapons makers who could, who could use these things. At any rate, so they're going to have to stay in town, that's great. They spend that day, we roleplay that day, with them uh, going through Armorer's Row, trying to find a, a weapons maker who can deal with this bone and turn it into a sword. They also have all these scales. Now, Full Fire can only wear leather armor, and Bob Donny already has plate mail. It's going to be as good as it gets. Um, Touchberry has a chain mail, and he's perfectly happy with it. But what they do want to do, they all want to use some dragon scales, some of the bigger ones, to make sort of uh, shoulder epaulets, you know. This <laughs> so they're going to they're gonna put those on as a sort of unifying, like they all have dragon scale uh, um, shoulder guards, the epaulets there. So, yeah, they, they find someone who can do that. It's not fine to punch a hole in the scales and, and you know, rig a, a, a harness on that can be strapped on. Sure, no problem. Fleetwood has a bunch of uh, dragon scales that he wants to make into scale mail armor. You may remember, if you really, really pay attention to these things, which, I mean, even I don't pay that much attention, but you may remember that he started out with chainmail armor, but in the layer of the Lizardmen, when he encountered that green slime, it melted the back of his armor. It pretty much ruined his, his armor. That was it. It was toast, right? So he needed new armor. He had leather armor, because at the very beginning, I think he started with leather armor. So he went back to his old leather armor, and he was wearing that, but that didn't give him a lot of protection. So he was intending to get scales fixed to the leather armor to turn it into scale mail armor. And so now he's got time to search for someone to do that. Also, not a hugely difficult thing. You know, in a city the size of Kilmarnock, there will be an armorer who's willing to take that on, right? It's just about making scale mail, but with dragon scales instead of metal scales, and it's doable. It's going to take a couple of days, though. It's not something you do right away. Fleetwood says, I will pay you extra if you drop all the other work you're doing and just do this. Oh, okay. Finding someone to make the dragon bone sword was harder. That was not something that, you know, obviously the blacksmiths don't want anything to do with it. The swordsmiths, they work in metal. They pound it into shape. They don't carve, right? That's not what they do. Eventually, what they found 
was a man who makes wooden practice swords for the town guard, for the count's troops. You need to train your troops, right? And if you're just learning, and you've got two of your own soldiers fighting each other for training, you don't hand them metal swords, necessarily. You're not handing them sharp metal swords. You'll end up with dead soldiers, right, instead of trained soldiers. So he starts them out with wooden swords. Mind you, I'm coming up with all of this in the moment because my kid says, remember I had that bone? I want to turn it into a sword. I'm like, how am I going to do that? So this wooden sword maker, all he does is make wooden swords for training for the army. So they find him and they bring him this thing and he's, you know, Oh, that looks like quite a challenge. Oh, that'd be interesting to work on, that would. I, I don't, all my characters sound like that. I, I, I can't help it. Oh, that would be quite a challenge. Don't even know if I have a, a knife and a cut a dragon's bone. And so he goes to get his sharpest knife. And he says, may I make a nick just to test? Oh, yeah, go ahead. So he tries to cut into the thing. Darn knife won't touch it. Darn knife won't touch it. Can't carve that at all. If I had a magic weapon, that might do. So Fleetwood says, would this work? And he draws his sword. Would that cut it? And so I can try. And he uses the sword. It's so bigger than I'm used to, but let me try. And he goes to carve the thing and says, ah, yeah, still not easy, but I can get through with this. So I said, well, what are we, we going to do? I can give up my sword, right? For the, the, the duration of this. How long is this going to take? Oh, just the carving of it at least three days. I don't can't this can't get this done in less than three days if I focus on just this. And they say, We'll pay you to just focus on this, but can you do it in three days? I I with this, if I've got this sword I can do it. So eventually somehow, and I don't know how it is, Fleetwood takes his sword back and Touchberry gives him his to use. I'm not sure why, especially at as low of hit points as they were. They could have used it to cure, you know, to do some curing along the way. But at any rate, they leave Touchberry's sword with this man, with many assurances that they'll get it back. And they pay him a little bit up front. They leave the dragon bone with him, and out they go. Now, as they leave, Fofire says, someone is following us. She's a thief. She's sort of attuned to these things. She notices someone has been following us. And she says, very subtly, he's over there dressed in a grayish-green cloak, large brown boots. Do you see him? And they eventually make contact. Yeah, yeah, I've got the guy. He's been following us ever since we went through the market square this morning. Okay, what are we going to do here? So they decide they're going to split up. They're going to take two different routes, and they're going to meet at the leather tankard for a meal. So they go different ways. So now I've got two groups, and I'm narrating each individually. The man decides to follow Faux Fire and Bob Johnny, and they head relatively directly toward the Leather Tankard, while Touchberry and Fleetwood take a circuitous route. They go into the market, partly because Touchberry wants to buy wine and cheese, and partly just to lose any potential pursuer. So into the market they go. As they go... They're looking around as they went following us, so now they're aware of it, and indeed, a second figure has begun following them. There's more than one person working on this. They start to get really freaked out. As Touchberry is shopping for wine, I tell Fleetwood, you notice the man, he's standing at a, at a booth uh, two rows over, and he's shopping for rope, but he's, he's just sort of fingering the rope and keeping an eye on you. This reminds Fleetwood that he actually does need rope. He used his to tie goblins up about two adventures back, right? So, he, oh yeah, I need some rope. I better go buy some. And so then while I'm buying it, I'm going to stand right next to him. I'm going to go right where he is and stand right next to him. It's so, okay, you approach. And as Fleetwood comes up, the man stiffens up a little bit. And as Fleetwood is looking at ropes, looks right at him. Says, I'm going to look right on, at him. All right? He turns away and just walks off. And he buys the rope at any rate. Touchberry buys wine and cheese. Back they go to the leather tankard, where they can't actually use the wine because you can't bring your own wine into a place. That just isn't done. But they have lunch and they spend the rest of the day so you know, shopping and stuff like that. Fine. That night they have a big wine and cheese party for the whole barracks, and, and all the soldiers now are really good friends with these four. These, these, are, these four are great. 
They are fine fellows. More wine? Yes, I will. Thank you. You guys are terrific, right? You know, uh, eating cheese. So, they make friends of the soldiers. We don't role-play all three days. I'm not going to belabor that point. I do give them the shopping list from, you know, from the, the rule book. Is that anything you want to buy, you can find it here. It's a big enough city. You can find all of this stuff. So they do a little shopping and you know, tidying up their equipment list, getting more oil flasks and stuff like that. Uh, all right, fine, great. On the third day, at breakfast, Faramir comes in and says, Be here tonight for the evening meal. They've been eating some of their meals other places. Okay, we'll be here for the evening meal. And that evening, as the meal is wrapping up, Faramir returns once again and says, Come with me. He leads them through the city streets. This time, as things are closing up, right? The market is closing, the shops are closing up, farmers have long since departed back to their fields, the streets are less traffic, there are very few people about, as he leads them through the market square to the Count's palace. The Count addresses them. I have a very particular mission for you. I require messengers. Messengers who will not be connected to me. If I send my own soldiers, too obvious, even without livery, they could be connected to me. But you will not be suspected. Two elves and a halfling and a woman thief? No one will attach that to Count Kilmarnock. And you have proven yourselves brave. I trust you. Will you undertake this mission for me? Well, what's, what's the mission? I need you to tell me if you will undertake it before I explain it to you. Okay, yes, we will. Obviously, again, this is clearly the game I have planned for them, so why would they not? Yes, we will. Excellent. You are to carry a message to the Ursine tribe. Do you know of them? Ursine? Now, my boys know enough to know that Ursine means bear. So, like, the, the bear tribe? Indeed. But not just any bears. They are lycanthropes. Ah, werebears. Okay. Yee. We've had a little experience with werewolves. Indeed, that is part of why I chose you. The werebears, however, are much different from their lupine cousins. They are noble, strong, Suspicious, wary of outsiders, they live apart from humans and often distrust us, but they are, at heart, a strong and decent people. You will carry a message to this tribe. And he puts his hand back, his gloved hand back, and from the darkness another gloved hand places a scroll case into it. This scroll case is magically sealed. It will only open for the first person to touch it. If any other attempts to force it open, it and the message it contains will instantly disintegrate. Ten minutes after it is opened, it and the message it contains will disintegrate. You must carry this message to the Ursine tribe. Tell them it is from me, and that it is to be read before the full gathering. You and only you can open it. You and only you can read it. He extends it forward. Now there's this moment. Who's going to take it? Well, of course it's my eldest, right? Like the eldest is always, I'll do it. So up he goes and takes the scroll case. As soon as he does, he can feel a tingling in his hand that runs up his arm and through his whole body. And the count says, this charge is now yours. Guard it with your life. If you are stopped on the road, if you are challenged, if you are questioned, deny any knowledge of me. Say that you are merchants carrying goods. We will see you equipped. Say nothing about your visit here. Do not mention my name. Do you understand? Yeah, we get it. If we're caught, the State Department will deny any knowledge of our mission, and this message will self-destruct. Where does he get his ideas? <laughs> Farewell. The road may be dangerous. Sandor? Sandor emerges from the shadows, comes down the steps, and says, Follow me. And into the night they go.